History is a part of memory. Memory is a part of history. What happens if you lose your memory and can't record any of that? This next episode is going to be really awesome. We talk with Travis Myers, who is a creative director and act advocate about creating memories and advocating for all of those things. And we talk about the impact of trauma and dementia. So how are all these things related? So check this out. Behind the scenes with me and Travis. Hello. Fortune favors the bold, victors write history, but what happens when history is lost? and memories are gone. This is gonna be an amazing episode because I'm here with Travis Myers, who's going to talk to us about his advocacy around creating the the long walk to equality, which is with Friends of Hanlon's, and it will become the world's longest rainbow war- road. That's right, yeah. The, the official term is like, because when you're dealing with superlatives, everything has to be precise, but it is the world's longest permanent rainbow. Um, so uh, we're really excited for that. And, uh, and all that it, it like symbolizes as well. Right. Because there's no, no, uh, nothing better than having insight driven creative when you can look at something and say, that looks really cool. And here's a cool reason why. Yeah, no. Yeah. And I, I'm so excited. We want to get into the cool reason why. Yeah. And then the other thing too, is I want people to hang on is this amazing connection. Uh, I mean, is it amazing, but the connection between how, trauma can lead to early onset dementia and why memories when they get lost need to be preserved. That's right. And and finding a way to capture that. That's right. Yeah. Then when it comes to queer memories as well, they're so fragile, but also so valuable. Um, And all that sort of ties into the issues with preserving queer history and preserving queer identities as well. Yeah. I'm so excited about this. So let's talk about uh, sort of what led to preserving history. Okay. So uh, I don't know if uh, you've ever been to Hanlon's Point before. You have? I have not been to Hanlon's Point. You call yourself a lesbian. (laughs) (laughs) I've been around it, but I just, you know, the clothing optional thing, I'm pretty clothed. a little spooky. Yeah. Yeah, I'm pretty clothed all the time. (laughs) Well, the interesting thing about Hanlon's Point is uh, it's still a queer stronghold today. And there is a clothing optional section of the beach, but if you walk anywhere along that I, that part of Toronto Island, you're going to encounter more queer people than you would see outside, of, probably more than you would see in the village in 2024. Wow. Um, it's one of the last places where you can really go as a queer person and say, I'm surrounded by people who are just like me. The two men holding hands, a trans woman enjoying her life, lesbians building sand castles, like the whole, the whole kit and caboodle. And it's a place that I have always had a special connection to because um, obviously as a queer person, there are so few safe spaces where you can go and feel like you're among people like yourself, but also safely able to express yourself for those guys to be holding hands for that trans woman to wear a bathing suit without having her body politicized and lesbians, I'm sure can build sand castles everywhere, but, <laughs> but no, but for those people to feel like they can really be a part of a community safely. Um, so for me, it's always been a really special place to go and it was actually under threat. Um, not that long ago. So it started in the the fall of 2022. There was a misguided plan to put a large scale concert venue at Hanlon's Point. Um, And if you remember as well in the news, probably, uh, I think it was a year before and then a couple years before that, there have been increasing instances of homophobic and transphobic violence, people being called slurs. And this place that I've always viewed as a utopia, you know, you get on a boat and you go to this island and suddenly you're in like this, this little pocket of the world that's just all queer people. Suddenly it felt like that was changing. Um, And I know I wasn't the only one as well. Like there was a lot of conversations around, you know, people I know professionally, friends, uh, people in community institutions around what was going on with this concert venue, what was going on with these changes at uh, Toronto Island at Hanlon's Point. And, um, so we did a little bit of digging and I, I'm part of a, you know, a group of friends, we're all nerds. Um, and when the times get tough, we start cracking open books. We start hitting the, hitting the library, the reference yeah, library, yeah. You know, going to the archives, things like that. And what we found is that this wasn't just a place that was special to us. This is a place that's been special to queer people for a really long time. 
Um, I had heard, you know, sort of a vague idea that the first Pride celebrations were held there. Um, and what I, we found was that the first Pride that took place, the first Pride gathering uh, for queer people that took place in all of Canada took place at Hanlon's Point in 1971. So that's not just queer history in Toronto. That's the nation's queer history. That's actually just Canada's history, wow. full stop. Yeah. Um, and it goes further than that too. Uh, 1971, it feels like a long time ago, but uh, the, the queer history goes back even further. Um, you know, we're recording this in 2024. That queer history goes back almost a century, yeah. um, which is crazy when you think about it, that, uh, you know, the idea of being a queer person, having any sort of safe space, having any sort of community gathering space in the 1920s, the 1930s, the 40s, even the 50s. Yeah. Um, it's not something that existed uh, to a large degree. So going back over all of these, you know, archival tidbits, all of these old photographs, discovering all of these personal stories of queer people who work to not only make this place exist, but then persist. It was something that I found so heartbreaking to think that, uh, you know, if I am able to go hit up the archives in my spare time, yeah. if I'm able to go, you know, look at the old like microfiche on weekends with friends at the reference yeah. library, that the folks who are in these big decision making capacities hadn't done it. It really did break my heart. Yeah. Um, and it, it was the same for a lot of other people too. Um, and it ties into a larger issue in the queer community is that we're not allowed to have access to our own history. For queer people, you, you, it's not like you have your Nona and Opa who teach you the stories of the old ways, you know, yeah. when you're growing up, you kind of show up when you're 18 and have to figure it all out yourself. Um, and so being able to connect with the people who have stood where you stood before, who have lived your same experience, it is an uphill battle. Um, and when it came to Hanlon's point and queer history in general, there is, you know, to, to use a bad analogy here, but there is a lot of erosion when it comes to it. Those, those moments exist in time, those historic moments or those experiences. And then as time goes on, it slowly slips away. Um, and we have to work so much harder when it comes to queer history to make sure that it doesn't erode away, that it doesn't slip away with the sands mm -hmm. of time. Um, and it just wasn't being done to the degree that this space not only, you know, needed, but deserved. Um, so that's when a group of nerds do what nerds do best. And we, we started publishing our research. We took it to the internet. We took it to, you know, professors at different university groups. We brought it up with the people who were in positions of authority, um, who could do something. I think, you know, uh, Kristen Wong Tan was a great supporter from the very start. Uh, Deputy Mayor Usma Malik, again, a, a very great supporter of this cause yeah. right from day one. Um, Olivia Chow kind of came into the picture a little bit later, but I know that she has a, a, a very soft spot in her heart for that beach as well. Um, and a group of volunteers, uh, you know, a group of community activists turned into uh, the people who were fighting against something and, and actually managed to accomplish something pretty big. Um, and that was getting the concert venue plan in turnaround. Um, getting Big feet. It, when it comes to, I mean, you you know how how slow things when it comes to governance can, can work. Uh, you know, it's the kind of things at a glacial pace. So getting that uh, decision reversed was monumental. But it doesn't just stop there either. You know, I think when we had been diving into the history of Hanlon's Point, what we found was that there was not just this one attempt to reprogram this space mm. um, because of the queer community's history being hidden out of necessity. Um, there were so many attempts over the century of people deciding, well, you know, I don't really like the people that spend time here. I don't really like the community that calls this place home. So we're going to find a better use for it. Um, whether that is, you know, uh, tearing down all the trees on the point because they wanted to make it better for folks to come in from downtown and go picnicking or tearing down the, the cottages that existed along Hanlon's Point. Yeah. We basically had our own fire island here in wow. Toronto yeah. full of summer homes. So basically a, in a summer cottage area that was exclusively or to the most part was for queer people. Um, and, uh, you know, those were torn down first when they, when they turned Toronto Island into a park. Um, and then also in the 1980s, there was a plan to redevelop the beach itself into a giant mechanical wave pool. And this is the one that gets my goat the most is that it's 
Can I swear on this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a you fucking know. beach. It's a <laughs> fucking beach. Why would it need a wave pool? Why would you need to pour cement on top of this beach and turn it into a giant mechanical wave pool? And the answer is really simple, that people didn't want to see the community that was there. People didn't want to recognize the people that had a very important connection to this space, and they wanted it to be something better, something different for other people. Um, so when it came to you know understanding that history, it was really clear that this near miss with the concert venue wasn't where everything ended. Um, Hanlon's had to come out of the closet essentially in order to, to say that this history matters, this place is yeah. important and something had to be done to make sure that, you know, this wasn't going to happen again. So that takes us to 2024. Yeah. Um, the community group has been working really hard on making sure that there's ecological measures in place, engaging with you know folks from various different city and provincial and, and federal uh, organizations to make sure that the, the space that this beach, this historic space exists in at this beach is being taken care of. Um, and then we've also been working on, I, you know, I get to put on my creative hat. Yeah. Um, so, uh, I guess we haven't even talked about my day job, have we? No. no. <laughs> what, what is your day? You can mention your yeah, day job because sure. I think it's a part of the tools and skills that you bring to yeah. your advocacy, right? Right. So uh, I work as a creative director. So um, a big part of my job is, you know, working with brands to determine what they want to communicate to a broader audience or to a narrow audience or to increase awareness. Um, and I was able to take all of those skills and apply it to the queer community's needs this yeah. time. Um, and I, I'm pretty happy with uh, the way that that messaging turned out because we did have a very important message to share with people and we were able to get it out yeah. in a way that resonated. Um, but being a creative is, is about more than, you know, crafting the right sentence for, yeah, you know, for media. It's about, you know, making things that, that can really impress upon people time and time again. Um, so, uh, we know, knowing what we know about Hanlon's point, knowing the importance of making sure that this place stays, um, stays, uh, you know, a top of mind when it comes to respecting queer history. Uh, we got to, I got to, uh, make a, an art installation, um, and it's going to be launching on May 25th of this year. Let's talk about this installation. Cause I think it's super, oh, wait, sorry. This is the, the rainbow road. You're doing so many cool things. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so my brain just fast forwarded to this other art installation. Well, this, you know, installation project that just happened recently. And I think is so important in terms of memories and documentation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Do you want to talk about which one first? Let's finish with this sure. one with the uh, with the installation that's coming up in May. So the installation is going to be called um, the Long Walk to Equality. Uh, and for anyone who there's any the installation is going to be called the Long Walk to Equality. And for anyone who's ever been along Toronto Island before, you know that once you get off that boat, there is just a very long winding pathway to get yeah. where you need to go. Um, and for that section of Toronto Island uh, where that first pride occurred. Uh, it'll be taken over. It'll be turned into uh, the world's longest permanent rainbow. So the entire road using that road grade is called MMA paint. Um, I designed and working with some fantastic partners on turning this into a permanent art installation that should last for decades um, to commemorate the folks who made that walk before we did. So if you can imagine whether that's in 1971, those people who walked along there to, to set up and celebrate that very first pride yeah. in all of Canada, or whether that's the folks who were there in the 1920s and the 1930s who were going there covertly just to be around folks who were like them. Um, that walk has been what queer people have been doing for nearly a century. And that's important history to recognize. And it's important for people to be able to walk along there and feel that connection to the people who came before, um, you know, to be able to have that tether to the past when we don't have it so often, um, especially with everything that's going on in the world right now, making that claim that we have always been here, that we have important mm -hmm. history, that we have these roots. That's how we make the claim that we deserve to be here today and that we deserve to be here tomorrow and the day after yeah, that and absolutely. the day after that. And that seems to be something that's called into question a lot lately. Um, so that's just one more tool for, for the arsenal to, to fight back against that type of bigotry. Well, I think it's going to be a very important reminder for everybody who goes there like, hey, what is this? Why is it rainbow, right? Like, yeah. I mean, what is that story? I mean, I think there will be definitely, like I, I, we were chatting before recording that there will be people who will, sh I'm sure, show up with like go-karts and do <laughs> their version of Mario Kart along the rainbow road. That was the hardest level though, so yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I think um, that journey is important and 
pre- preservation is really important. And so I appreciate you advocating for that because bringing people together and saying, hey, we got to fight again, right? And the fight never ends. And I think it's the memory of um, motivating people, the memories that we need to protect, to defend, as you've just said, like, well, it's not like you have a Nona who can tell you, oh, this is what we used to do. You, When those memories are gone and mm-hmm. there's no connection, you lose that bridge. Well, and that's exactly like uh, another great project that, uh, you know, we were talking about as well. Um, EGAL, this Canada's largest organization for queer people and ideas, um, recently released some research about the the fragile nature of queer memory mm-hmm. um, and the importance of supporting queer identities when it comes to dementia care. Because uh, those same people that we're talking about, those folks who were there in 71, yeah. those folks who were there in the 60s, the 50s, uh, even up to the 80s and 90s, who were really kicking open that door for people like you and I, um, they not everyone gets a happy ending, essentially. Um, so there's this really... You know, it's really important to know about this. It's called chronic minority stress, and it can happen to anyone, whether you're, uh, you know, a person of color, a member of a queer community, or any other group that's been othered before, uh, made to feel less than, made to feel different, having to fight for your rights and your respect. Um, and you can only you can only fight against hatred so long before it takes a toll on you. It takes a toll on your brain, um, and that bigotry it changes the way that your brain processes work. It's like a machine, you know, yeah. you can only uh, kick a kick a motor of a car so many times before that motor will stop working as well. Yeah. And for those people who are at the forefront of, you know, fighting for queer rights um, throughout those decades, those are the folks who are getting older now. And what they're finding is that there is a much higher incidence of dementia and cognitive decline uh, for people in the 2S LGBTQI plus community. And it's so tragic because, you know, when we're talking about those periods of time, like we just we just saw with Hanlon's, we're talking about these periods of time when things had to be under wraps for safety, when things couldn't be, you know, out and loud and proud. And a lot of this stuff, really, this history only exists in people's memories now. And when dementia comes, you know, know, when dementia takes hold, um, we, we as a community lose access to it. And that person loses access to their own identity as well. The one that they fought so hard for. Yeah. And, That's the part which is so moving because the early onset of dementia is like, if you take, think about that, here are people who stood up, who fought for things with much, um, they could have lost everything. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And in the face of that adversity, opening up so many doors and pushing through, they carry the weight of that experience with them into their old age. Mm -hmm. And so with dementia, I mean, we, we see that even now, right? Like our healthcare system is reporting like more and more people who have early onset dementia. And the fact that there's a study that was put out by a gal, I think we need to put a light on this yeah, yeah. Um, and what we can do. And so I want to talk about the project, um, Help Us Remain, mm-hmm. because yeah. I think it's really important because I think it's so easy to forget because when you're young, you're not really worried about being old no you know and then when you're old you're like wait we forgot we forgot we forgot yeah and and so there's that disconnect and because there isn't the same legacy of passing sharing memories down like there's no photos well it's it's kind of the inverse of what we were just talking about when you know like not having that that oma and opa the gay gay grandpa gay grandma uh, to teach you how things work we as you know the younger the younger side of things we don't take the time to care for our elders Um, and those elders, the people who did, the people who marched, the people who fought so we can have what we have, they're really left without that younger generation to support them in a way that heterosexual or cisgender people know that they can count on. Uh, I guess maybe for you, it's you, you, you'll have some kids to take care of you at old age, but um, I know for a lot of people, they don't have the, that lineage who can be able to come back and take care of them when they do reach um, you know, the point of life where they need uh, additional supports as well. So it, it's really complicated in a lot of ways. It's like really queer people aging is, I mean, a lot of queer people just didn't think that they would age period when they were living through the AIDS crisis, when they were living yeah. through, you know, the entire world hating them, even up to as recently as, you know, uh, all the continual debates over whether or not people deserve to have rights or not. Uh, it's easy to see how people could just not not worry about what comes tomorrow because they're so focused on just getting through today. Um, and now that tomorrow has come for a lot of people, nobody had made the plans for them to be able to age with dignity uh, yeah. or to to plan their healthcare arrangements around their identity in the way that they deserve to. Yeah, and I, and I think just on to that point, 
Um, this is something where I think 519 had studies to show that as there are more seniors who, as, as you know, the queer community is aging, that those supports aren't there and that a lot of people reported having to go back into the closet and hiding their identity. And it's also another form of trauma mm -hmm. where you can't be your whole self. Um, so th that's why it's kind of very near and dear to me in terms of like, how do we make those connections and preserve it? So with regards to the Help Us Remain project, the the recording of stories, um, yeah, tell it, me about that. It was, you know, it was something that I obviously have a, a big interest in legacy and finding out, uh, you know, the stories of the people who, who, uh, helped shape the world that I currently inhabit. Um, cause it's not something that gets a whole lot of attention. So I was really excited to be able to, you know, use, use the issues around dementia as a way of looking into the past, you know, sort of like a time machine into, into where things might be. Um, at, at risk of being erased. Yeah. Um, and so with this project, I got to speak to 10 amazing queer Canadians who are uh, seniors who have, you know, either been experiencing dementia themselves or they have a partner who's living with dementia or they're in a high risk category for dementia or just people who have some very pointed views on what queer memory means and why it's important to hold on to. And, uh, you know, it was, this was actually like getting to, getting to know the gay grandpa that I never had, the gay yeah. grandma that I never had. Yeah. Um, those people who, who can show me their experience as a way of guiding my own life moving forward. And their stories really touched me in a lot of ways as well. Um, like there's one woman from, uh, from Winnipeg who they were the ones who fought for queer people to have the right to adopt in that province. And that was something that they had to work so hard to accomplish and then when it's all said and done, their reward um, is living with one of, one of those partners having dementia because of the struggle that she had to endure throughout her entire life. Yeah. Um, and in, so many of these stories are rooted in people who had the best intentions and really wanted to do the most for their community. Um, and now that they, they need our help, now that they need our support, there's no one there to help them. Yeah. What, like, if we just take a moment to think about allyship, um, to people with dementia and, or, you know, where we are in the world, what can you recommend? I think that allyship takes a lot of different forms yeah. for people within the community. We need to always be looking for the folks who are in the, the alphabet mafia who don't have that same level of support as we yeah. do. Right. And that's not saying that there's anyone who necessarily has it easy in 2024. Um, but I think that there's a lot of, there's a lot of different scale within what equality looks like in the community. Mm -hmm. So that could be, you know, a, a gay person who is a senior citizen who's dealing with dementia. That could be a trans person who's coming to terms with their identity. That could be, you know, a lesbian person of any different background, any different discipline within the community yeah. who needs help. Yeah. Um, and then there's allyship outside of the community as well, right? Yeah. And there's the people who maybe the the folks who know that person, or the, the folks who know about people like that, using their voice to elevate those causes and make sure that change happens. Because yeah. when folks in the community are asking for help. They're not just, you know, whistling Dixie. Like these are people who actually need help. They need support. Yeah. So finding ways to help elevate what they're doing and get it across the finish line um, is something that anyone can take part in. Yeah. And, and I appreciate that because I think the call to action is be aware and and step up when you can. Because, you know, when you mentioned like, oh, well, I have kids who will be able to, you know, hopefully take care of us if, if that were to happen. Um, having children was not something... I fought for on the front lines as the first person. Mm -hmm. it is. But you would have had the experience of like, what was that like for you in those early days being a gay parent? That, that couldn't have been easy. No, it wasn't, but I wasn't also the first, right? Right. And, I, and well, how, I old, how old your oldest is? Nine. nine? Okay. Yeah. So my but old, even like the, the, yeah. the light years change between oh, today and nine years ago. Oh, Cause did you know any other gay moms at the school no, or in the groups or anything really. like that? I mean, we were just, I guess we were, you know, actually that's a great question as I reflect upon it because Having a community space, you know, Church and uh, Wellesley is a very well-known community for, you know, uh, queer family. Well, not queer families, for the community. But once again, that area is also being gentrified a little bit, right? Mm -hmm. It's becoming more and more expensive to be there, to have establishments, and things are changing. But 519 was the hub. Yeah. And there were classes, and people could come to learn about how to do it. But... 
it was like, oh, what? You want to have kids? Oh, you want to have kids? There's, you know, there's, it was Dykes Planning Tykes is what the program was called. And they Dykes changed Planning the Tykes. Yeah. <laughs> and then, um, <laughs> was it Daddies and Papas? Or, I can't even remember, but, um, but I just remember like, oh, we're not the only people. And I know for my own family, it was like, they didn't want me to be gay because they were like, but you're not going to have kids. Like they they just really wanted the kids. So once right? you once you had the kids, they were like, oh, you know what? Being gay is not that bad. I mean, like to some degree, right? But <laughs> but it is it is like, oh, but you can't have kids. Like, I think that was the first thing. Like, will you have a family? Family is really important. Mm -hmm. So it's it's really interesting when you ask me that, because I remember like, do we know other people who had there? There might have been like the organizer. I mean, she was someone who's well known in the community who, you know, I had a kid that was, I think, 15 years old. So mm -hmm. that was 15 years ahead of me, of us. And that was a journey too, right? But, yeah. But I'm very much grateful for the people who advocated and fought for the marriage, the right to marry, the right to have, have kids. So this part, it's like, you know, the gay opa, the gay OP, right? Like, mm -hmm. um, that what do we do to help them? I think there really does need to be some some way of translating experience better across generations. Yeah. Um, I don't I don't know what that is. Yeah. Uh, like from where I stand, what I want to do is just make the biggest thing possible so that someone looks at it. They're like, that's LGBT, you know, yeah. when it comes to places and moments. Um, but there's also that human scale translation of like, this is the experiences that different people had. This is how we got here yeah. that we're really missing. Yeah. And I think a lot of people would say, you know, the knee jerk is like, well, put gay stuff in, put queer stuff, trans stuff in the history mm -hmm. books. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I think that there's got, there's got to be more that can be done just to, to get that peer to peer, you know, yeah. like that, that older queer person to that 20 something queer person explaining to them how we got here, because so many people don't seem to really understand how it, how it came to be. Yeah. And, and with the way that, you know, with the way that we process information now, uh, through 30 second clips on TikTok, yeah. it's really hard to get a foothold in with anyone's attention to Absolutely. be able to tell them, you know, uh, and if you're watching on TikTok, hi. <laughs> Travis. Um, I, I agree. And, and I think we might not have all the answers. We certainly won't. But I think asking the question of, hey, wait a minute, let's just let's shine a light on this. Mm -hmm. Like we're not the first people doing it. There may be more. I mean, certainly I'm of the generation now where there are a lot of people around my age having kids. Right. And that there are people are more normalized to seeing blended families and different types of families. Mm -hmm. And but it's that connection of the stories of, you know, the people who had to go through AIDS. What happened to the stories of those people who, you know, aren't here anymore to tell that story? And there are so many different ties to the present as well. I think that what what it is is maybe like a just a lack of people finding the opportunities to tell the stories, whether that's yeah. about individuals or whether it's about historic moments. Like just the other day, um, I, I was looking into the guy who wrote Dune. You know, oh, I don't know if you've seen this, yeah. Dune 2. I haven't seen it yet, but I, I, yeah. Yeah, and he had a, a gay son who um, he, like this guy was on top of the world when he had written these, like the first book I think was a bestseller and his son was gay and he hated that and he disowned him. Um, and then what he did was he made the villains in the Dune universe queer people and homosexuality having some sort of inherent sickness or wrongness about it in the world of Dune while well, his son was dying of AIDS. And like, that's just something that I think there's a lot of people who would not understand. It, it feels so wrong to hear it now. Yeah, you know? for sure. Um, but uh, the, the great opportunity of, you know, like the movie coming out is to talk about, well, this is the way that things used to be. Yeah. And this was not an uncommon experience yeah. for a lot of people at all, right? Yeah. Um, and so what, what's the next opportunity to make that connection to the past? What's the next opportunity to, you know, to tie where we are now to where we've been? I think that's a really important question. I think the start of this is how you have been recording these stories to document it mm -hmm. is step one. And, and then even just as you're talking, I'm thinking about how do we actually create that in-person human connection of our elder, our aging mm -hmm. community and providing those supports? Because for sure, I, I have colleagues, friends um, who I know who actually had a family through cis relationships. Um, and then we're like, oh, wait, I'm going to come out now. 
right? And also going back into the closet. Like it's 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 so complex mm-hmm. and and there isn't a one size fits all, but I think the rec general recognition that there is a connection or a gap to connect things and to learn from one another and to have a history of of this so that we can learn from it. Well, actually one of the, one of the couples that I spoke to as part of the help us remain project. Um, she, uh, she had a lot of love to give and for her, I know she had adopted a bunch of fosters. It's the same couple I was telling you about where yeah. they fought for adoption rights. Um, and she still has a lot of love to give and she can see what's happening with so many people who don't have receptive families who don't have receptive parents, let alone, grandparents yeah. and she was saying that she wants to farm herself out as an adopter grandma <laughs> you know grandma, yeah right. so to make that connection between the queer youth who don't have those supports and the queer elder who needs someone in their life to help yeah. give that that love and affection out to somebody yeah and i think that's important i mean love i mean at the heart of all this you know the symbol of the rainbow chosen family mm-hmm. and how powerful love is as a connector um of all people like i think that's really powerful you know, in terms of there's so much need for love. And in the absence of love, we seek it in other places. Yeah. But, and sometimes you have to create your family, which is a family that's a healthier family Yeah. that allows you to be your whole self um, without feeling like you have to hide parts of it. And so this is the part in my mind where I've heard stories from elders who are like, I have to go back into the closet again as I'm aging in an old age home or seeking supports. And yeah. you're constantly having to document. And, you know, like when you go to a hospital or you go, you, you, it's okay, your name and you go through all your vitals and your history and everything. And it's just another form of reliving. For a lot trauma. of those seniors. Yeah. Like there's an intense fear of what their caregivers, whether that's the, the nurses or the hospital staff or nursing home staff will think of them if they know that they're a member of the community, which yeah. is, you know, you're thinking of the years when they would have come of age as well. It makes a lot of sense. Uh, like their last institutional contact would have been probably in school in the 1940s yeah. or 50s or something like yeah. that. So going back into an institutional environment, they would want to just hide who that part of who they are again. Also for people in that generation too, um, it's not uncommon for people to, you know, for lack of a better term, keep their private life private. So yeah. they may have a completely queer and happy life, but when it comes to their family members or their professional life or any of those interactions with, uh, you know, more formal settings, they don't include that part. So when they go into a formalized nursing situation, then they leave that part of themselves behind for fear of retribution. Um, and that's so real, yeah. right? Like, I mean, there are times where it's like not safe. And yeah. safety is a concern. We live in an, an environment which is growing more and more hostile and less tolerant. And physical safety is really important. Mm-hmm. Um, and so vul- that vulnerability is something that, you know, like anyone who has experienced othering is aware of. Yeah. Yeah. And I, it's it's difficult to to put myself in that, that person's shoes because I, no one's making those decisions lightly either, no. right? You're doing what you feel like you need to do to, to get by. But when you're in a nursing home, you shouldn't have to feel like you're getting by. You shouldn't yeah. have to feel like you're making sacrifices as a part of your identity just to be able to, you know, to get a bed somewhere, to get proper health care. Yeah. So that's something that definitely needs to change the way that we approach identities within our healthcare system. Yeah. Make sure that people are being supportive. Make sure that, you know, if somebody does come in with, you know, unique pronouns or a, like a partner, they don't need to take time to explain it for the fear of having to be you yeah. know, or for the fear of retribution that could come with it, the healthcare system should be ready to receive them. Yeah. And there's a lot of great people, you know, that I spoke to as part of this project as well, who work within the healthcare system, who wholeheartedly agree that, yeah. that there's uh, a big push towards recognizing all different kinds of identity within senior care, yeah. um, whether that be someone's cultural background or their, like their first language um, and queer identities. It's, it's more of a conversation now around finding those places where queer people can be yeah. safer in nursing homes or yeah. in long-term care situations. Um, we're not there yet though. So that's why raising awareness about this is really important yeah. for that final push, for that allyship from you know people who this may not never impact, yeah. uh, this may not ever impact to be able to add their, add their hands onto that push to make it possible. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I'm just sort of thinking about the connection of where we started this conversation in 1971 of... Hanlon's point and the journey, the long road to equality, um, 
where are those folks who fought for, who came together, stood up at the very least are now in a point where they're entering older, old age homes. That's right. And, and they, as we have talked about losing their memories and losing their ability to advocate for themselves, experiencing dementia and watching people I care about who have dementia is really sad. Yeah. They just slowly, and slowly disappearing, right? They're day slowly by day. disappearing. Yeah. And who are those people who can advocate for them? So that, and that's where we, as the next gen, as the next generation or the younger people or allies can really, I think that's, that's, is that a mantle that we pick up, mm -hmm. right? That, that there's a responsibility there to say, okay, well, let's try and make at least aging in place, aging in care can be more humane or where you don't have to live with fear. Well, actually there was a really, there's a really neat place where these two projects intersected. And uh, one of the couples that I spoke to where one of them, one of them has dementia is currently in the, the middle stages of dementia. Um, the, the guy who doesn't have dementia was actually there at the first pride. Wow. And they had been uh, actually visiting Hamlin's point for decades. And they had all of these great stories that I got to download from them for, you know, historic research is a lot of looking at old records, but it's also a lot of understanding humanity, understanding the people who are there enjoying the space as well. Um, so the world's colliding there was really something special for me because I got to get those last little bits of, of emotion and memory about the thing that I cared about. I hear yeah. so much about from someone who, you know, won't, won't have those memories in the days ahead. So, yeah. um, it's almost like, uh, you know, it feels like getting something just, just in time. Um, but I, I wish that the situation didn't have to be getting it just in time as yeah. well. Um, I wish that, you know, I wish that for, for John and James, that they would have the ability to tell those stories forever. Um, but yeah. that's not the world that we live in, unfortunately. But it's, yeah. And I'm so glad that you caught it, but I think it helps at least crack the door open a little bit so that people are aware that there's some, a need for this and this awareness. And when we first started talking about documentation for, um, for the long walk to equality or Hamlin's point, and about, oh, we should, we need pictures, we need photos. Like, even when you think about camera and technology, it's also, you'd have to have privilege to own a camera. Right. That's really funny. Okay. You, you want to talk about all my work today? Do you, yeah. are you, you want to talk about the Molson course project that I worked on last you year? You talk about whatever you want. Okay. I don't know. I'm just, I'm not, I don't know. I, I, I'm, de uh, I'm just, just thinking about that as we were talking about it. Yeah. yeah. So last year, um, to, to celebrate pride, like I, I think we can all, I don't know for the, for the straight folks at home, if you can remember what it was like, but like, it seemed like a watershed moment where the world was turning its back on a lot of the progress that was being made. Um, and, uh, and in order to celebrate pride, uh, Molson, I was working on a project with Molson Coors to respect the histories and identities of queer people. Again, this, this theme that I, uh, I spend so much of my time working on is respecting queer past to protect queer futures. Yeah. Um, and the, the idea that we struck upon was that, um, and I'm not sure if you know this, that the photo booth was the original safe space for a lot of people. So if you're going back in time to the 1940s, the 1930s, 1950s even, um, there were so many people who didn't have access to a camera who wanted to be able to uh, show their love to somebody. And even if they did have access to a camera, you lose the privacy of your relationship. So you take a photo with your, you know, with your longtime partner or, you know, dressing up in drag for the first time, exploring your gender identity, any of the things that you were not allowed to do by law. And that photo goes to get developed. Well, it, there's a chain of custody where any number of people could see those images where your cover could be blown, where your yeah. life could be destroyed. So queer people would go to photo booths where you are in a box on all sides. Nobody can see in what's happening. The film strip gets deposited. You grab it immediately. And so when you're looking back for evidence of queer couples throughout time, the one thing that you can always count on finding are film strips, photo wow. strips from photo booths. So what we wanted to do was you know, we wanted to look back, make sure that this important piece of history wasn't lost um, and change it for the modern day, because that made sense for people in 1950. It doesn't make sense to hide that way when you're in 2024. So we redesigned the photo booth to make it completely transparent. We've made it with beautiful neon yeah. lights. We put it in the middle, the middle of the pride celebration I at the totally 519 of Pride this. Toronto. I don't know, you did this. Yeah. So cool. So I'm like, wait, wait, wait. 
<laughs> so it was, uh, it was really happy to be able to, I was really happy to be able to share that history with people because I didn't know it. Yeah. And I feel like I'm constantly retracing these steps and finding out this is something that pertains to my life, to my, my identity. I wish I'd known this. And now I want to tell other people so that they can know it as yeah. well. Um, and that was this really beautiful moment of pride because let's face it as well. A lot of people were just enjoying a drink or two and they said, Hey, cool photo booth. Why is it see-through? Um, and we got to give them that moment of like, actually, this is an important part of, you know, how you got to where you are today, wow. celebrating pride, you know, with the, the thousands of other people dancing on church street. So I think that's pretty cool as someone who has a background in art history and being a bit of a, a nerd when it comes to archival type of things that was like a moment where people are in the space and actually living through like experiential learning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. It's like embodiment history through osmosis. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> wow. That is so cool. I didn't actually know that, but I, I remember that booth and I was, Oh, this is super cool. So cool. I, I feel like so many of the things that you do are led with passion and really this thoughtfulness around. I mean, maybe like we're talking about some of my absolute favorite stuff yeah, today. Yeah, like yeah. there's, there's always projects that, yeah, yeah. you know, keep the lights on, but there's, I, I do try and incorporate my own personal passions into everything that I'm working on. I think every creative has the thing that they, they're like white, white, the story that they want to mm -hmm. tell in some way, shape or form. And for me, it's always been queer issues. Um, the thing that I never saw in any yeah. sort of, you know, creative media, whether that be advertising or storytelling, not too much when I was growing up. So giving people that ability to see their own life reflected back at them is something that I'm really trying to really trying to incorporate into more projects. Yeah. No, I love it. And I think it's so important. I just think about our conversation today. It was just like, like, I feel like things were exploding in my head as you were talking, the synapses were going. It's like, oh my goodness, like we don't have this issue. Like we're embodying our lives and living through it. And then that's it. Like there's no, it's not like you're passing it down generations because everybody's so busy fending for themselves mm -hmm. and trying to live their best lives. And then at the end of it, it's just gone. Mm -hmm. And with Without memories, there's no history. Without history, there's no memories. And people can't refer to the past, right? That's really profound, yeah. Well, I, I feel like the work you're doing is really profound. And so I really appreciate that. Um, so we, we talked about, you know, allyship and how it can take form in different ways. Is there like a call to action, like a further call to action that people, anybody who is interested can do? I think that uh, everyone can take part in, should I speak to yeah. camera? Okay, yeah. I think that everyone should take part in preserving queer history. Um, all it takes is, uh, you know, passing on stories that you know, passing on stories that you care about, uh, engaging with the people you care about and making sure that, let me start this again. Now, this is, this is <laughs> yeah, uh, sure. what was the question again? A call to action. But, uh, like what can people do? And we talked about allyship and... I think that queer history needs to be preserved um, just by the nature of it. It's not something that sticks around on its own, making sure that we we take that effort to make sure that it stays for. Let's start again. I'm sorry. I don't know why I'm getting so. No, it's up. all good. Just yeah. go with it. Just flow. OK, um, I think that. I think that queer history needs to be preserved. It's not something that sticks around forever on its own. Uh, it will f fall away if we don't take the effort to preserve it. So making sure that queer history is preserved is is paramount when it comes to. Let's put a pen in it. Yeah, I don't know why That's I keep tripping up on my words on this no, one. No, it's great. I mean, OK, L let's talk about a favorite quote. I always like to end with a favorite quote. You've got tons of quotes going through your head. So yeah, is there well, one? I my call to action, preserve queer history, uh, preserve queer identities, make sure that queer people feel respected uh, and represented in whatever, whatever you're doing, because they definitely want to feel rep represented and respected uh, as well. That's awesome. All right. There we go. Best I could do. <laughs> no, I, I mean, I, I think it's, it's authentic. I think it's real. And like you're living it, like you're doing it, you know? And so I appreciate that. I think it is profound. I mean, lots of the stuff you say, I'm like, oh yeah, let me think about that. That's pretty smart. <laughs> but quote, what's a favorite quote? 
Oh, gosh. Um, I think that there's this one quote by, I think it's Aristotle. Um, it's the mark of a great mind to entertain an idea without necessarily agreeing to it. Um, and to me, it's always been like, keep your mind open. You know, you don't need to be so firmly entrenched in one uh, camp or another. You don't have to like, have your mind made up for you before you explore something. I think a lot of really great stuff happens when you open your mind up and start playing around with ideas. Yeah. And you can figure out for yourself what you like and what you don't. I like that. I almost feel like that's an insight to how to stay creative and thinking outside of the box mm -hmm. because I feel we're living in a time in a world where everybody's so, you know, like how people are doing so many selfies and they stare at themselves so much. I think like probably more and more people are doing Botox and all this stuff to the face because they see themselves in the screen that's so much. That's the real thing. It's the, they call it the Zoom effect where like after March, 2020, everyone would look at their own little picture in the corner of every Zoom call that they're on. And they started changing their aesthetics specifically around how they show up on a webcam. So I feel like it's probably the exact same thing for, for cell phones and uh, trying to find your way of, you know, your way of being creative that doesn't necessarily come prepackaged. Yeah. Um, you know, thinking about different things and creative ways is a great way to get those juices flowing. We need more of that, right? Because I, I, I fear that loss of creativity and I fear that loss of making connections and preserving those things. So I have really enjoyed our time talking and connecting like present day with the past and how the past impacts our future and that we can all be stewards of that in one, you know, as a protector, as a defender, as a, a fierce advocate. So thank you so much for your thank time. Thank you for having me. <laughs> what matters to you matters to me. And on Tea with Lee, we get in focus with a lot of movers and shakers who are here to share their knowledge with us. So like, share, subscribe, and make sure you don't miss out on the next great interview.